Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to Bates Botanical Boot Camp. We are talking about common houseplant problems today. Um, we're going to cover a pretty wide basis of problems that you can have with your houseplants, whether it's pest, disease, or abiotic, just an environmental change, human error. Um, we're going to keep it to kind of the more simple things. We will open up for a Q&A um, here and there dur during the webinar, but feel free to write down any questions at all um, that you have on your houseplants, problems, you know, concerns, what have you. Um, so like I said, we're going to touch on three topics today. Abiotic, just meaning non-living agents, um, non-biological, human error, things that aren't alive um, with your plant. So putting it in the wrong spot. Problems with watering, overwatering, underwatering, um, fertilization, all of those fun things. Pretty broad topic. Um, second one, we're going to talk about pests. So that's like scale, mealybugs, pretty much any living um, creature, spider that can get on your plant in the soil that can cause damage, um, harm, or is just kind of annoying. And then the third one we're going to touch on are diseases, fungus, um, and bacterial infections with house plants. So let's kick this off by talking about human error. So when people come into the nursery um, to ask questions about house plants that they've had for a while, maybe it's a new plant, um, it's showing signs of stress. Uh, my first question, as well as other um, landscape specialist and houseplant specialist is usually how often are you watering? Now when it comes down to watering, all plants um, are not equal in the amount of water they need and also seasons change that need for them as well as whether it's inside or outside. So whenever you get your new plant, um, always research how often it needs to be watered. A good rule of thumb is to let the first half inch to inch of the soil in the pot dry out between waterings. Now, if it's a succulent, cacti, those are completely different. They need to be dry for a while. And then there's other plants that like to stay moist. So like I said earlier, not all plants are equal when it comes to watering. So like I said, people come in, that's our first question. How often do you water? What are the signs that it's showing of stress? Um, a good indicator is usually leaves. Um, they'll start turning yellow. That's a good sign of overwatering, especially if they're kind of, um, like moist and soft. If it's underwatering, it'll be a little crispier. So I do have an example here with me today that I wanted to touch on at the top of the webinar, which is this beautiful peace lily that I have sitting to my right. Um, you can see the leaves look, they, they look healthy, they're a great color, but she is drooping a little bit. And the reason why that's happening is because her soil has completely dried out, which I did let happen. This is my plant I brought from home, um, just so I could show you just signs of underwatering. So this is a typical sign. Peace lilies bounce back right away. Um, it's gonna recover fully from this. This isn't gonna cause the plant any damage whatsoever. This is also a good starter plant. So if you're getting into house plants, peace lilies are a good one um, to start with because they do let you know when they need water. So I brought a cute little watering can in here with me today. So we're gonna do a little experiment. I'm gonna water this plant up. Um, and then throughout the webinar, depending on how long we go, she should perk up a little bit. It's not gonna go fast enough to really notice any signs, but I thought it would be kind of fun. Um, I do have a saucer underneath to catch the water and I'm gonna take this let's show off this watering can Ooh, so pretty and also kind of put some water down in the saucer so it can absorb some through the root system and draw it up to the plant now when my plants get like this I usually kind of overly water them to make sure I saturate that soil now that being said, it's primarily like leafy plants. I don't do that with my cacti or succulents. Um, I will let it sit, depending on how dry it is and what the plant is, for no more than 30 minutes in that saucer of water before I do take it out, dump the excess water out of the saucer, um, and make sure it, the pot itself is not holding a lot of moisture because that's going to lead to root rot eventually. All right, so our beautiful peace lily is watered. Um, she should start perking up soon. She'll definitely be full, gorgeous, very luscious by, I would say, one o'clock today. They don't take long to bounce back. Um, so you can always put your eyes on this 
bad girl and watch her as we talk today. Um, so one of the biggest problems when it comes to over and underwatering just water problems is root rot. Root rot is going to come from watering your plant too much, from too much moisture sitting on those roots or down in the pot. So I always tell customers when they come in, when they have questions, when people call, um, always underwater as opposed to overwater. So if you th you're not sure how much water it needs, start with a little bit, let the soil dry out and go from there. It is a lot easier to come back from underwatering, from letting that soil and that plant dry out than overwatering. So we've talked about root rot. Um, so let's touch on that a little bit. If your plant starts showing signs of root rot, um, leaves are dropping, they're yellowing, um, it'll eventually lead to fungus, some bacterial infections. Um, overwatering can cause a lot of damage. But if you think that's your problem, let your plant dry out. If it's not starting to bounce back, go ahead and pull the pot or the plant out of its pot and check the root system. Um, genuine or usually roots should be like a white color, tan. Um, sometimes with like Dracaena and Sansevieria, they're a bright reddish um, orange color. They should never be black. So if your roots are starting to turn black, you might have lost your plant and it might be time to throw it away. If not, you can change out that soil, repot it, let it stay dry for a little bit um, and hope for the best. With the leaves that had started yellowing and browning, you'll want to just trim those off and let them, um, sorry, I got distracted by a Tyler hand coming up. Um, trim off the dead leaves, the leaves that are damaged uh, and the plant should perk uh, right back up. So we've talked about watering. Again, if you have any questions at all, you can put them in the comment box um, in Zoom or Facebook. You can leave them in the comments and Tyler will get me those questions. So when it comes to drainage from watering, you're going to always want drainage holes in your pots. I talk about this all the time in my webinars. Um, I always bring it up. We have a lot of great pots here, great pots. I see them at Marshall's, TJ Maxx, all around town that don't have drainage holes. So those are gonna be cachets and I always recommend keeping your plant in a nursery pot or even the pot it came in if it's not time to be repotted and setting that pot into the cache and then dumping out the excess water once you're done watering, um, which is what I had talked about with our beautiful peace lily, which she kind of looks like she's starting to perk up a little bit. So drainage is an important thing, especially when it comes to watering. Um, and it's also going to help get a little bit of airflow to your roots. It's not going to keep everything um, contained, super moist and warm. So with pots being said, we've talked about cachets, nursery pots. If you're wondering what a nursery pot is, it's just the pot that your plant usually comes in when you purchase that plant from a plant nursery, whether it's in person or online. Um, pot size is really important um, when you know, learning about plants and facing problems with your plants. You never want to pot your plant up more than like two inches unless it's a huge plant and it's super root bound. Um, I have people ask about that a lot. They'll come to me with like a small three inch pot, which is this right here. And they'll have, you know, like a six inch pot about this size and say, well, I really want to put this plant in this pot. Do you think it's going to work? No. I mean, unless you're, you know, you've been raising house plants for a long time um, and you know the plant that you're buying. If you're new to it, don't size up that much. What that's gonna do is hold too much moisture in when you water your plant, lead to root rot, lead to diseases um, and draw in pests with all that excess moisture. So you always wanna size up like half an inch to two inches depending on the plant size and the pot that it was already in. So we're talking a lot about pots today. So let's just keep going. Um, all plants grow at a different rate um, and it depends on, you know, the, the conditions for the plant, whether it's getting fertilized, how the growing conditions are. But eventually you are going to have to repot your plant. As surprising as it sounds, I do get that question a lot. Can I just leave it in this pot forever? Yes, you could. It would kind of go into the world of bonsaiing, you would have to water it way more often. It's not going to be able to get the nutrients it needs to grow. It's going to be stunted and eventually it's more than likely going to start dying. Um, so depending on the plant, some plants need to be repotted every year. Some can stay in the same pot for years. Like some of my cacti, um, I wait 
two to four years before I repot them because they do like to be root bound. They don't grow that quickly. So they don't need to be potted up too often. Um, and when I say root bound, what I mean is when you pull the plant out of the pot, we've got this lovely little tornado dracaena here. So you see how the roots um, are kind of growing around each other. They're getting tight. For a Dracaena, this isn't bad. This could probably handle another season. Um, but if it was a more leafy plant, say a Calathea, a Peace Lily, it might be about time to repot that plant. Um, once they get severely root bound, like I was talking about earlier, it's going to be hard for them to draw up moisture when you water and also take in nutrients um, when you fertilize or just from the fertilization that's in the soil if you when you repot it. Um, so when you do repot it, you always wanna make sure you break up those roots. You don't just take that plant out of its pot, leave it in that shape of the nursery pot, and then stick it in a bigger pot with new soil um, because it's still gonna be growing in a bound way instead of spreading those roots out. Don't be afraid to break the roots, it happens. I mean, I break mine and it's actually better for it. Just make sure you don't cut off all your roots because then that, you know, might be problematic a little bit would you say the like the more that the roots look like the shape of the pot on the inside the more root bound it is and need yes. for urgency yes um great question so yeah it'll start to take the shape of the pot and i've actually it goes with like plants on our lot too when i've bought shrubs and trees to plant they, they will come pretty root bound. Um, so sometimes you pull a plant out of the pot and the soil just falls off and you can see the roots, but they're not growing around each other and making a shape of that pot. So when you do that, chances are that plant does not need to be repotted. It hasn't had a time, enough time to really let its roots sink in. So if you see when I pull this plant up, it just takes the shape of this pot and then I can just set it back in. Um, there's no soil left in the pot. I mean, a little bit fell off right there, but not a ton. So some plants will get extremely root bound. And I'm actually gonna pull up this beautiful um, Swiss cheese Monstera. Let's give her a look. She looks gorgeous, but if you notice, she's got a couple um, leaves at the bottom that are yellowing. I actually cleaned this one not too long ago. And what that is, is this plant being root bound. Um, so some of the older leaves are starting to drop. Not a bad thing. We get that question with um, a lot of people call about their fiddle leaves. They're like, oh, some of the leaves, the older leaves towards the bottom are starting to turn yellow and drop. That's a natural thing for leaves to shed off plants. Um, but it is an indicator of a few things. One of them is that plant being root bound. So I'm going to set her down here and pull her up. Now this plant is very much root bound um, and I will probably separate this one pretty soon and I'm sure I'll have to take a knife or um, gardening shears which I have right here to just cut up the roots to make sure um, they are able to breathe and keep on growing all right, got a little tangle going on. While I'm getting this tangle out, Tyler, do we have any questions? Okay. No questions at the moment, but keep feel free going. to chat them out anytime. We can cover... I love questions. A rather I, wide range of... Huh? Yeah, we can cover a rather <laughs> wide range of subjects. <laughs> yes, we can. We can answer. Between Tyler and I, we can answer a lot of... Maybe not all the questions about plants in the entire world, but... Um, we can hit on them. Okay, so I started touching on leaves dropping. It's a natural thing. If one to two leaves on your plant is turning yellow and dropping, it's normal. Um, don't panic. It happens. You can take the leaf off before it drops or wait. I always just remove them because I'm not a fan of that look. Now, if it starts spreading um, to the middle growth or even to the new growth, that's where you do have, um, you should be concerned. There is definitely a problem with it, um, and it could be those three factors that I talked about at the beginning. Um, human error, 
pests or disease. So if it's gonna be human error, like we talked about, watering is always the main culprit. So make sure you kind of adjust your watering, check on that. You can even call the nursery and send pictures or come in. We have people bring their plants even if they didn't buy them here to help diagnose the problem because it is hard to diagnose it without actually seeing it. It could also just be a change of environment. So if you just bought a fiddle leaf fig, um, those are known for being pretty finicky. They don't like changing environments or even changing a spot in the same room. Um, they will start to shed their leaves. So when people buy them in a nursery, bring them home, chances are it is gonna go through a um, stage where it's trying to adjust to its new environment it's gonna drop leaves and it might get a little droopy and look sad. That being said, that shouldn't last more than a month. Two months tops, two months is really pushing it. So anything past that, um, it's more than likely a different issue. So it's not trying to adjust anymore. It's trying to let you know that there's something else wrong. You literally no. naturally answered a question that was just asked <gasps> about it. Wow. That spins winter inside and summer outside, a fiddle mm -hmm. leaf. It's very happy in the summer acts like a deciduous tree in winter and completely loses its leaves. So they will do that. Um, I have a variegated rubber tree, which I did bring a leaf from, <laughs> who looks sad. We'll talk about that later. I'm a little embarrassed by it, so I'm gonna hide it, but I will bring it back. Um, this plant, to me, some of these hybrids that are variegated are a lot harder to take care of and do have more leaf problems. I don't, I don't know why, and maybe I just, think that and I've had trouble with mine um, but that plant in particular I put it outside in the summer it does great it grows so quickly it looks so happy um, when I bring it in in the winter I think last winter by the time I brought it out it had like one healthy leaf left but then it reflushed um, and that is a ficus so it's in the same family as a fiddle leaf so they are prone to dropping their leaves and a lot of times they will regrow um, it could just be them going dormant basically going to bed and saying I don't like winter I don't like you bringing me into this space let me know when you bring me back out and I'm ready to shine and grow again so the leaves dropping isn't necessarily a bad thing um, like I said one sign it could be overwatering. Um, but it could also be that it's not getting enough light. So I've talked a lot about fiddle leaf figs. They're a great example. They're one of the most trendy plants right now. We sell a lot of them. You see them in magazines, catalogs all the time. Um, if those plants aren't getting enough light, they will sustain for a few months um, before they start dropping their leaves. Um, photosynthesis isn't working the right way. It tried, um, it's gonna start shedding. Doesn't mean it's dying take that plant, put it into a brighter location, um, not into direct sun. You never want to shock a plant by taking it from being inside or from getting diffused light and just stick it in eight hours of sunlight. That's recipe for failure. Um, the, all those leaves will burn and fall off and the plant will probably die. So best course of action is just to move it to a brighter spot um, in that room or a different room that gets a little bit brighter light. Uh, my fiddle leaf during the winter, I keep in like a west facing window. So it does get a little bit of direct sunlight through the window um, for a couple hours a day. So. We got another question here. Mm -hmm. I, I always kill my calatheas, although I am good with other plants. What specific issues make them so finicky? They are, um, great plants but i have a love-hate relationship with them calatheas in particular they need a lot of humidity um so if you're losing that plant i don't know if you said what season it, you start to lose them uh i don't think she did winter is usually when they start showing signs of a lot of distress um and i think i, I think that was the fiddle leaf that was losing its leaves in winter the calatheas just seem to just die outright <laughs> they Poor things. um they like a lot of humidity, um, but with that, they if their soil stays too moist... She said brown tips. So the brown tips is humidity. I actually brought um, a calathea in. So you can see on this one, um, we kind of got them in like this. This is just, it's not getting enough humidity and it's dry. So there's no coming... Okay, the plant will be fine. Yes, this plant's gonna thrive. And you can see, um, sorry, Tyler, you just zoomed in and then zoomed back out. You can see the new growth isn't, we're getting wild with the camera today. Um, doesn't have that brown tip. It's really tender, gorgeous. Um, 
the plant itself is fine. It's just letting you know that it has a problem with its environment. The brown tips on the leaves, the leaf isn't ever gonna fully flush back out. So if it does bother you, you can remove the leaves. I suggest removing them. Um, this is a moment I can get my shears out all the way. This one looks pretty bad um, down by the stem, but make sure you're not cutting any of the new leaves coming out. So I just took that leaf at the base, but you see, let's see. Ah, there's the leaf that was blocking that new growth that's coming out. Always watch for that. I've gotten in a hurry with um, pruning my plants and, and cut off some new growth and gotten really, really sad about it. Um, so it's not, it's not going to hurt the plant to leave them with their brown tips. It might just be an eyesore for you. Um, and I always tell people, I think that pruning your plants actually promotes new growth and it's going to stop trying to absorb the nutrients to those older parts of the plants that maybe weren't so pretty. So taking them back is actually pretty beneficial, but not, um, not necessary. So just while we're on plant talk, I'm going to bring this next gal to the stage. Um, this Audrey ficus. We've talked a lot about ficus, fiddle leaf. Um, I brought up my variegated fiddle, or variegated ficus. This little Audrey you can see is so root bound that her roots are growing out of the bottom of the pot. Look at that. Oh, we got to get around this peace lily leaf. There we go. Wow. So if you see this lower leaf, it's the lowest leaf on the plant. All right, Peace Lily, she's starting to perk up and now she's getting in the way. Um, has some spotting, which that's a good indicator that it's time to repot this um, Audrey. And if you, you know, are ever wondering, if those roots start growing out of the bottom, it is definitely time to repot that plant. What I do with the leaves that are getting older, just take them off. Then you're done, you don't have to look at it anymore. And once you're able to remedy that problem and put it in a new larger pot that's not too big. Um, this may segue into another question that someone asks. Are you supposed to snap new growth off on a rubber plant to encourage it to grow outward or bushier versus upward like a tree? Um, absolutely, you can do that, it's up to you. You can top it, that's usually what I call it. Um, so you can take a cutting. I wouldn't do it from like just the new growth. You don't want to take like just the new leaves coming off, but cut from the stem. And then it is going to push out new growth. Usually it'll grow like at least two new branches off of that spot where you cut. And you can propagate um, the cutting that you took. Ficus are usually pretty easy to prop. I have a few Altissima that I've propped. I just took a cutting off the top just to keep it like shorter and more of a tree form instead of getting too spindly. Um, put it in some rooting hormones, st stuck it in some moist soil, and it took like a week for it to start rooting. So you can top it, you can cut it at the top just to, you know, promote new growth in a different way, or you can let it keep going. I have to top a lot of my plants at this point when I bring them in for the winter because they've gotten too tall for my ceilings. So, uh oh. That's a whole other problem. That is a whole other problem. Um, uh, I've got one other question in here. Yeah. Uh, my Sansevieria grow a tall flower stalk this last month. I thought that was cool, but then Reddit means the plant is stressed. Is this true? I have heard that. Uh, mind bloom. It, it can mean the plant is stressed. It's just pushing out uh, more energy for that flower and sending less energy to the leaves of the plants. Um, so I usually will let it bloom and then cut it back and it'll be fine. I fertilize my Sansevieria like twice a year. Um, so it might need, if you haven't fertilized it, it might need that. But it's not like a cause for concern. The flowers are actually really pretty. I don't know if you've smelled yours. They have like a nice um, light scent kind of depending on what variety of Sansevieria you do have. Do we have any more? Any tips to avoid stem rot on Peperomia? not overwatering. Um, I, I mean, I would ask how often you're watering it with any peperomia I have. Um, I let them dry out completely between waterings. I actually have a couple different varieties and I was talking to one of our landscape specialists this morning about one that he has that he's been experimenting with. He 
said he probably hasn't watered his in a good two months. The soil's just been completely dry and the plant's growing. Um, so I would let that soil dry out. Sometimes when it starts rotting from the base, um, you can think you, you'll be able to save it, uh, but eventually it is gonna just rot, like crown rot, all that. Um, there's usually no going back from that. So sorry if I was just the bearer of bad news about <laughs> your plant. Lay it on them. It could also come back, um, but just let it dry out. I always tell people if you suspect any kind of rot, whether it's crown rot, rot, you know, my cacti, I've actually lost cacti that have rotted, um, or just holding too much moisture in the soil, take that plant out of the pot. You can even knock off all the old soil, uh, let it dry out. Sometimes I put mine in just straight perlite to help dry it out and then freshen up the soil after that. Yeah, she's just saying she waters them once a week, so she's And what was it again? A peperomia. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, for me, that's probably too much. I would cut back and try like every other week and see if that um, helps fix the problem. But definitely go ahead and let it dry out completely before you water it next time. Um, I'm a fan of, with a lot of my house plants, I would say like 70% of them, I let them dry out completely or halfway. And then I do like a full flush to water them. Um, I'll run the water all the way through to where it drains out of the bottom of the pot. One, I'm making sure I get water all the way down to the new roots growing at the base of the pot. Um, also, it helps just flush out the salts that are holding in that soil um, and just anything that could be hiding in there. Every so often, I've had people um, ask about watering and I you know, say, how often are you watering and how much? And uh, I know one person had like a, probably they said like a five foot fiddle leaf fig and a you know, 14 inch, when I say 14 inch, I'm talking about dia diameter across pot and they were watering it every day. And I was like, well, that's a lot. How much are you watering it every day? And they are watering it half a cup a day. So that sounds like they're watering it a lot, but they're not giving it enough water. That half a cup um, is basically going to evaporate before it gets to those new roots that actually really need it. So you want to be watering it a fairly significant amount, especially if you're letting it dry out um, in between waterings. That's all we've got for now, so go Perfect. on ahead. Keep them coming, though. I love questions. So another one that I wanted to touch on um, when it comes to like abiotic factors is stretching or reaching. So if your plant isn't getting enough light, um, it's going to start reaching for the closest light source not a bad thing I've let that happen with some of my house plants because I actually think it looks kind of cool um, sorry I just got distracted by this piece lily because it has flushed up so much flushed up is that the right way to say it I don't know but it looks great Recovered. Um, <laughs> so stretching or you know reaching they're just gonna start like growing towards the light so instead of coming straight up and down they're going to start growing to the side now one thing that that can cause that's not a great thing to look at and is a little unhealthy for the plant it'll start to get kind of spindly like instead of if it is a audrey ficus who you know the leaves are growing out like an inch away from the leaf below it or less and it's pretty bushy and full if it starts reaching and there's a couple inches between the older leaf and the newer one, it's reaching for light too much and it's not able to get enough um, for photosynthesis. And that eventually is going to be bad. It's an indicator that that plant is not getting enough light for, um, for what it is, for its needs. Um, and those conditions are not right and just need to be remedied. Would that be something like if, if you have a begonia, uh, like an angel wing begonia, and there's more than like four or five inches between the leaves some of those stem. some angel wing begonias grow that way like the cane begonias they do have a lot of room in between um but sometimes that's an indicator of low light um one way to remedy the reaching and stretching not necessarily um growing sparsely is just turning your pot so if you don't have the luxury of finding a brighter spot maybe all your windows are already full of plants like mine, um, you can rotate the pot. So it will kind of even it out as it starts to kind of reach the other direction. It'll come back to center. Um, some people suggest rotating like once a week. Sometimes people rotate a full circle every day. If you're home, if you're working from home right now, you can just do a quarter turn, 
you know, morning, lunchtime, snack time in the afternoon. <laughs> and dinner. I mean, there's no sun at dinner, so <laughs> figure that one out. I don't know. Daylight hours only. Daylight hours only. That's right. Uh, Do we... Anna has a, uh, a question, I guess, or a request. Any tips for a strawberry begonia? Um, could you be more specific with it? Sure. Or just growing it in general? I mean, we can, we can talk about just growing a strawberry begonia. They do like, so if you, if you want to go further in depth with your question, if I don't answer it, feel free to keep typing. Um, strawberry begonias, they can grow in shade. Um, and actually, fun fact that I learned this year, they are a perennial here in Middle Tennessee. Um, so you can plant them outside. So I studied on that a little bit. And I think their needs as far as an outside plant goes, which will relate to them inside, um, is close to like a heuchera or a hosta. Like they do like shade. They don't like bright direct sunlight. Um, I have one sitting in a north facing window, so it's never getting direct sunlight. Um, I let it dry out between waterings. I probably water this one once a week because it's in a smaller pot, probably a little bit root bound. Um, and I do fertilize that one once a month during like growing season. So I start like March ish and fertilize through September before I bring all my house plants in. Um, so with that one, not direct sunlight, um, definitely not like afternoon sunlight. That'll probably start burning the leaves. If you have it inside instead of planting it outside, they do start growing little arms. And at first it just looks like a root or something. But eventually once that arm gets to be a few inches, um, sometimes even like a foot, depending on the maturity of the plant, it will start growing um, basically a new plant. It's really cool. It's like a little little air, air plant, if you will. Um, it'll start to develop those leaves. It'll get larger and then you can prop those. So I hope that answered your question. If not, um, ask away. I'm not seeing any other follow-up, so continue on. Great. But again, strawberry begonias are perennial here in Zone 7, Middle Tennessee. Um, so, you know, if you have one and you don't love it or it's having some issues, stick it in the ground in some shade outside and just see, um, see how she does. I'm going to try that with mine because I have too many to bring in this winter. Um, so we've talked a lot about leaves. We're going to go into more pests now. Um, so if you're looking at your leaf and it looks like it's kind of distorting, growing abnormally, stunted growth, the leaf isn't getting as big as the other ones, um, that's a good indicator that you have some pests present in your house plant, which is not the end of the world. Um, it happens and there are treatments for them. Um, and usually you can get rid of them. So one thing with pests before we start talking about it is um, quarantining. If you have a lot of houseplants and you're concerned about bringing something home and spreading, you're never guaranteed when you get a plant at any nursery, um, no matter how fancy, that that plant is not going to come with some kind of pest or even disease. Um, some pests are so small like thrips that you can't see them until they're pretty mature. I mean, you're, you could take a magnifying glass and look at that plant all day and find something. Um, but if you, you know, you don't carry one in your pocket or in your purse, then you might bring home something. Um, so I suggest to people, if they're worried about pests, to always quarantine their new plants. Give it about two weeks. Within two weeks, if that plant does have a pest or some kind of issue, you should be able to see it by then and then figure out the next course of action for treatment. Um, so like I said, a good indicator is um, abnormal growth that usually means that that pest has been around for a while so if you see a plant um, you know I hate to say here we monitor our plants we clean them we actually have like a plant rehab area so normally you won't find any of our plants with anything bad um, but it does happen but if you know here Home Depot what have you uh, if you see some growth that looks really cool and you're like, wow, that looks like a cool mutation. I'm going to make a million dollars off that plant. Uh, research at first. It probably is just a pest or some kind of problem that has caused damage to the cells. Um, they do like suck out moisture from leaves. And so that's why it causes that abnormal growth. So look out for that. And then before we stop talking about leaves within the plant and fully move to pests, 
um, I wanted to just touch on spotted leaves. So leaves will start spotting. We talked about the tips of your leaves turning brown or yellow, the whole leaf turning yellow. Again, usually signs um, or indicators of a watering issue. Now, if it starts getting spots, that's more of a cause for concern. Um, that could be fungal, it could be a disease, the fungus, it can get fungal bacterial problems from pests, they can spread from that and from overwatering. Um, so it's time to bring up this leaf that I'm very embarrassed about. So this is not, this was, <laughs> it's just so bad. Um, That's right, I'm <laughs> emphasizing it. shaming me. And this is one of my favorite plants, but I made the mistake of putting it in a corner of my front porch that didn't get good air circulation and where I forgot about it because it was surrounded by other plants. Um, so this definitely has a disease, um, which is treatable. I have removed all of the leaves that look like this. Um, but if you notice the spotting, how it's not at the tips, um, and working its way in there's actually new spotting if you i'm pointing at the back of the leaf like you can see the back of the leaf and everything i don't have cameras behind me you can't see that um like that spot here in the middle it's starting to spot and then it's going to grow out um that is something that you want to treat and remove all those dead leaves we will talk about this more but while i was talking about leaf spotting i did want to bring this in because i'm sure some of you got a glance of this leaf and then I took it away and you were just dying waiting to see it again. Um, while I have more leaves down here, I forgot about this bad boy. So before we move on to pests, we're going to talk about sunburning your plants. Um, going back to our fiddle leaf talk, I was speaking about leaf shedding and if they're not getting enough light you never want to stick them out in direct sunlight um, plants can get sunburned and it sucks because there's no going back from being sunburned you have to remove those leaves if you don't like how they look it's not going to cause big issues it's not going to go down into the root system um, but it doesn't look pretty so when you buy a new plant um, or the seasons are changing and you want to put your plants outside do not just stick them right in full afternoon sunlight. Um, so this is what a sunburnt plant looks like. So it starts to turn, it'll turn either yellow or white. Um, this actually happened when we got some new plants in, a new shipment, and they got just unloaded in the parking lot. I mean, this was in the parking lot for probably 10 minutes and got sunburned like this. So if you think about these house plants come from being in diffused lights in their greenhouse, um, then they get you know, ship to wherever they're going, they're not used to being in direct sunlight, <clears throat> that's gonna burn the leaves really quickly. So if you see something like that on your leaves, like a white or a light yellow color, check the sunlight and make sure it's not just getting pelted with direct hot, especially afternoon sunlight can be very dangerous um, to your plants. Okay. We have a question that, uh Someone's asking, what is the best way to depest and remove bugs from your plants when you bring them indoors for winter? And answer this how, whenever you like, because okay. I know you're going into pests. That's a great question for our next um, segment, which we're going to talk about pests. So I have like eight pests that we're going to touch on. I'm not going to go super in depth because this webinar could go on for hours. Um, there's actually a great webinar that Austin did, one of our landscape specialists here, about I think it was common houseplant pests that he did last winter. Um, so if you're looking for more, um, if you want to just watch another webinar that we do here, kind of learn more about specific pests and how you can treat that individual one. Um, check out that webinar. He is full of great information about bugs and pests. Didn't you also do one on winterizing houseplants? I did do one on winterizing houseplants, um, on how to, what you should do to bring your houseplant inside and acclimate it. Because they do love being outside and then they, you know, I hate winter when I have to go inside and I can't sit in the sun and swim all the time, which is basically what your plants are doing. Um, so it does take some time and there is another great webinar, which I do about winterizing your house plants. Um, but we will talk about pests. One of my favorite things, just the question we got about treatment. Um, I like to use insecticidal soap to treat my plants and I'll usually kind of give a lot of my plants a treatment before I bring them in for the winter. Um, but the eight that we're going to touch on, which are the primary 
pest problems for houseplants, aphids, mealybugs, spider mites, scale, whitefly, thrips, and fungus gnats. So I would say one of the, I mean, they're all pretty common. It depends on the plant, but let's start with aphids. Aphids, usually I see them on plants that are outside. Um, they're not a huge problem, especially if you spot them early. They love new, like tender, innocent growth. Um, so when I find it, I usually find it on um, like the new growth that's pushing out. So if aphids were to be on something, more than likely you would find them like at the top of the plant. Um, I had a picture. I don't know if we can bring it up or not. I'll leave that up to Tyler. I don't have it. At the Could I put it? No. If I brought my phone screen up, that probably wouldn't work. You can look up Just, aphids. Yeah. <laughs> Google it. Um, there's a lot of different kinds. They can be like white, dark, brown, yellow. I've even seen kind of some reddish ones. Like there's a lot of different kinds. Um, and there's some predatory insects that will take care of aphids, um, especially if they're outside. But like I said, they're easy to treat. Um, what I do if I find them, I will spray the plant off with... Um, you know, some pressure with my water. If you've got a sink that's got a sprayer, spray it. I'll usually tilt the plant, um, like instead of spraying straight down where you might damage your leaves, I will tilt the plant towards the side and kind of spray behind and then wipe off the aphids. They're easy to see. Um, sometimes they'll get into little crevices near where that infest infestation is. Um, I will let the plant dry out and then I usually will treat it with neem oil or horticultural spray. You can also use um, like a dish soap, uh, like home remedy if you don't want to go out and buy something. It, a lot of that stuff is also kind of in short supply right now. So if you do soap and water, uh, just a few drops in a quart of water um, and you can use that to treat it. That usually will knock it out. Um, just check on it for the next few weeks. You can reapply if you're worried about it. Um, but that should suffocate them and also spraying them off will uh, will work. But they do, like I said, they feed on the new growth. So check new growth if you see these little weird looking bugs. I mean, all of these bugs that we're gonna talk about, these pests are tiny. So some of them are really hard to see. So moving on from that to mealy bugs. Um, this is one of the more prolific pests that I see with houseplants um, and probably my most hated one. They are terrible. So I, they are a type of scale, I believe. Um, they're white, they're fuzzy, and they get into the crevices of plants. And when I say crevices, I mean like where the leaf meets the stem, where the new growth is. Sometimes they'll get, I'll find them underneath the leaf, um, kind of near where the veins are, like trying to hide, but they can't. Luckily they're white for the most part, so you can find them pretty easily. Um, but if you see one, that means you have more. Make sure you always kind of check all underneath the leaves, those crevices. Um, you, I will use a lot of the time with mealy bugs, I'll take rubbing alcohol on a Q-tip and wipe the mealy bugs off that I find. And then I'm a fan of then spraying it down just like I do with aphids and then treating it um, with, you know, some kind of insecticidal treatment, whether it's neem oil, uh, insecticidal soap, horticultural spray, something, or that uh, soap mixture that we talked about earlier. Um, mealybugs can get out of hand, so don't think just because you have one or three that you're like, oh, I can leave it, it'll be fine. Um, they will take over your plant. They're going to feed off of, um, like, draw the sap, the moisture out of the leaves, and that is one um, one of those pests that do cause mutation in the new growth of the leaves. Um, and they will basically, I mean, it looks like a nest. They'll like get in there and it'll be all white and gross and nasty. So you always want to treat stuff when you start, when you see the problem at first. Um, so moving on to spider mites. Ooh, these are fun. They're not, they're not fun at all. Um, basically, like it says, they're tiny little bitty arachnids. So they are spiders. They do have webbing. Um, they're going to be like little white specks on your leaves. They can be on the top or bottom. Um, I've seen them on the top of my leaves. I've seen them on the bottom. They're pretty easy to treat. Same thing. You can do neem oil. You can do insecticidal soap to treat them. 
I haven't really talked about how those treatments work, but basically those just suffocate the pest um, and they're going to kill it. So you do have to keep retreating until you're pest free. It's not going to be like a one time thing that you put on and it's going to poison those pests, which there is something that I'll talk about later. Um, this is something that has to be reapplied in order to control um, the infestation. With spider mites, um, they will start to, if you're your, if your leaves, especially the new growth, starts to look um, like pale, is losing its color. I've seen spider mites take over a croton before. Um, and crotons are usually like really brightly colored or if the foliage is pretty dark, you know, it's still vibrant. Um, it's like they're sucking the life out of the leaf. Like that leaf will start to lose color. It'll start to get a little spotty. Um, but that's once that those spider mites have taken over a lot um, so if you see them if you see some webbing could just be spider web so always check to make sure it's not just a friendly spider that might help you with treating things um, but you'll see all those tiny little spider mites um, and some of their webbing and you'll want to treat that just chiming in here i mm -hmm. i posted a link into the chat and zoom about um, common houseplant pests the webinar that we did where we took a microscope and looked took a closer look at some of the active bugs that were on on plants so if you want to get a look at those take a look at that webinar it's a good one i've watched it um and i i mean i learn a lot from everybody here like there's always more to learn and there's so many pests and when we get into diseases there are so many um and a lot you don't really know what the specific disease is but luckily there's lots of treatments out there um but definitely check out that webinar if you want to learn more or if you're just a houseplant enthusiast it will really help you with um treating problems um with your plants so spider mites again they suck they basically suck the life out of your plant um but it's something that's treatable all three of these things that i have talked about aphids mealybugs and spider mites do spread um, especially spider mites they will quickly spread to other plants so as soon as you notice a problem on one of your house plants take that plant away get it away from all your other plants and go ahead i mean it's time consuming but we love house plants that's why we have them um, check it out and see if there's any others that have spread to those plants scale now scale i feel like isn't as bad i think it's easier to treat um it sucks and it will take over your plant but this is going to suck out your plant's juices just like the other ones it's going to feed off that it's like a little plant leech um, it actually looks kind of like a plant leech so these are hard-bodied um pests like the mealybugs i said were some type of scale they're a softer body so they're easier to kill with that cotton swab you can take them off scale itself um harder they're like a little oval round i had a picture but we don't have it up again you can always just google scale it lots of different colors with that It'd be like tan <laughs> tyler's clapping over there sorry fly <laughs> keep going so there's a there's another type of pest in the room a fly um lots of different colors but it's basically like a little oval pest that's like flat and it will i usually find it on well all over the plant i even have some on a cacti at home which sucks um but a good form of treatment like i said you can do the soap and water you can do neem oil or rubbing alcohol the good thing about scale is they're really easy to remove um especially on my cacti i've just taken like a a dish towel why i couldn't think of the word i don't know um and gotten some soapy water on it and just wiped the scale off um cleaned off all that i could see then i treated it with i love insecticidal soap i treated it with that sprayed it down um and then just kept coming back to make sure it was treated so if i were to get any pest out of the four i've just talked about i would much rather have scale than anything else um some other people might have different opinions on that um you know we're all different Ooh, there's something up on the screen that's exciting oh ignore that <laughs> um, so yeah scale again it's going to feed off your plant so you do want to get rid of it it'll eventually take over um you will find scale inside and outside like all of these pests will be inside and outside it's not just specific to house plants a lot of these will spread to trees to shrubs um they'll go everywhere so thrips this is something that i fingers crossed knock on wood have never had to battle and hopefully won't um these are 
tiny, 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 like microscopic pests that you can't really see until they're there. Um, you'll notice like on the edging of some leaves, they go after leaves and flowers. Um, if you start to have damage on the outside of the leaf, like not the watering kind of damage, it's just a tip that's yellow or brown. Towards the edging, um, this is where a mic microscope, magnifying glass will come in handy. Um, the new thrips are gonna be white, like the little babies. And um, as they get older, they're gonna turn like a darker brown. So if you start to see darker brown, oh, I, I don't know if you can see what, I, what I'm seeing. Yeah, I, I put them up there, I figured it out. On the screen. Yep. Um, there we go. So there they are, again, they they're like microscopic. evil shrimp. They are <laughs> exactly what Tyler said. They are like evil shrimp and they are gonna feed on your plants and flowers. Um, I've actually seen outbreaks of them on like annual flowers. They really go after those like tender, new, beautiful, colorful flowers. They just want to suck the, those little evil shrimp, want to suck the life out of everything. Um, treatment for that is pretty much the same. Um, like we talked about the oils, the soaps, you can use that. We will talk about some different treatments um, towards the end of our pest segment. Um, white flies something that you're going to get. They're a gnat-like insect um, and a good way to, I mean, you'll see these, like there's something that you're going to see on your plant, but your leaves will start to turn pale, yellow, or white, um, and you can treat it the same way. Now, when you take these oil-based treatments, you're usually going to want to treat the underside of the leaf because you might disrupt photosynthesis with the top of the leaf. Um, it can kind of suffocate it because these are oils and soaps that are made to suffocate this pest. Um, ooh, yeah, there it is. Can they see that too? So there's white flies. Yep. So like I said, you can tell that these aren't under a microscope for these images. So that's something that you're gonna be able to see. Uh, it's not pretty. You should be able to see it from a couple feet away if you have this issue. White flies are really easy to treat um, and get rid of those. And then the last one is going to be fungus gnats. Fungus gnats are usually an indicator of your soil being too moist. Um, so I've gotten them once before. I just let that soil dry out completely and it got rid of them. Um, if they are problematic, if they're staying, you can't get rid of them. Um, you can treat it. You can treat the top of the soil. You can also remove it with um, all the oils that we've been talking about. So that comes to the end of those eight pests that I wanted to touch on. Um, ooh, Tyler bringing up all these big I know, pictures. I know. They're so gross once they get large. Can you pull up an aphid? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's just go through them. So that's an aphid. They are, like I said, they can be lots of different color. Ugh, they're nasty. They're gross. There's those, yeah, those yellow ones. Um, and if you don't treat them, they will start to secrete honeydew, um, which can turn into other problems like molds. So when I say secrete honeydew, they're basically pooping out stuff that stays on your plant and it's going to cause other problems. Um, can we bring up mealybugs or scale? Mm. Yeah, they're nasty. Oh gosh, when you see them up close. So you see how those are getting into the crevice of that leaf. Like they get in there um, and like the more adult, the more mature ones are going to be a lot easier to see. Yep, that's the picture. So that's when I was talking about those mealy bugs like turning into a nest. I mean, it looks like a Halloween decoration, like some scary little spider web. Uh, you don't want yours to get that far. So you want to be checking to make sure you're treating that um, long before that type of infestation happens. All right. Spider mites are scale, Tyler. Now there is a there's like a brown scale, right? And then there's another kind. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. a lot of different... There's a lot of different types of scale. Um, and like I said, it, it affects house plants and non house plants. Yeah. So I'm trying to see the scale that I've dealt with the most. And of course I don't have on my glasses and the screen is a little further away. Um, yeah. So right there, that's one that I've dealt with or looks similar to that, but you can see their little hard bodies. They almost look like those, um, crustaceans is that the right word yep. when you're in a creek and you over you turn over a rock and you see those they look very similar to that so or if you're like huh barnacles. this looks like some barnacle some prehistoric creature cool on my plant not cool you want to treat that and get that um 
out of the way. And I think the last one we haven't looked at maybe is spider mites. There it is. There's that spider mite. So you saw that first image that Tyler had up. You could kind of see how it had like drained the life out of that leaf. Um, that's literally what they do. They just suck the life out of your plant. Um, so that's something that you want to get under control as soon as possible. A friend of mine had bought a new plant, went out of town for like a week and a half. And when she came back, the plant was like encased in spider webs, like from the spider mites. They had totally enclosed the plant and spread to her other plants. So always, that's why it's important to quarantine. Not get a new plant and then put them with your other plants and then go out of town. Uh, she did throw that plant away. You know, when, when it gets that bad, usually your best option is to just toss it. But if your plant is really important to you and you're like, you know what, these oils, this soap mixture that I made is not working, you do have other options. There's a lot of different things out there. Um, I don't like to go into like non-organic or more basically poison, but I have used this before. So this is a systemic houseplant insect control. What that means is it's going to absorb through the root system and then those pests that are feeding on the plants will be poisoned so it's not going to treat um those pests right away you won't put this in and within like you know five minutes or one week notice those insects are dying it they're gonna have to be feeding on that new growth um in order for it to take care of that um so if your infestation is just out of control that is an option to try um like i said i used it on one of my fiddle leaves i kind of just wanted to see how it worked and how long it took and <laughs> i let this fiddle leaf just get ravaged by um spider mites because honestly i was kind of trying to kill it which is still alive and i used this and it did fine um, if you do use the systemic house plant control it is bad for pollinators so be mindful of that um, it also is poisonous to your pets um, so you're going to want to put that plant in a safe place away from your pets and bees if you know that's something you care about which we all should <laughs> yes um, okay we're going to just speed through this the last thing um, I love this three in run it's a non-organic um, treatment but it's going to treat it says it on the front insecticide fungicide and miticide so it's going to treat all those things which I'm going to wrap up really quickly by talking about diseases um, so diseases fungus bacterial infections or something that happens it can happen to any plants uh, one of the biggest causes is moisture and overwatering, um, or also if it has a pest, like we were talking about that honeydew, it's going to lead to further problems. Um, so it's always good to catch your problems. If it's watering, those leaves will start telling you that. Um, if it's a pest, take care of that before it goes further into a disease um, or something like that. So the honeydew I was talking about, that's going to then go to sooty mold, which uh, can come from scale, white fly, or aphids. You can wipe that mold off with um, an oil. You can treat it that way. Um, this three-in-one spray that has pyrethrin in it, uh, which it's not the healthiest thing, but if you're all out of options, um, being a fungicide, that's going to work for a lot of things. What's important with um, fungus that can develop on your plant watering like I said air circulation drainage and removing dead leaves so all of those things can lead to diseases and viruses if those things are left untreated um, so basically keep your plant looking good keep your plant looking healthy powdery mildew um, something that happens to indoor outdoor plants can be treated um, an organic treatment that I know Tyler has used copper fungicide um, so if you're, you're wanting to go a more organic route, that's a very good option for a lot of these um, fungal problems. But um, like I said with this, I removed all of the leaves that look like this, or even a little bit. Like if you have these leaves um, and it's clearly gonna be fungal or bacterial, um, you are gonna wanna remove them. Even if it's just like a little tiny spot, it's gonna spread. Um, so I've treated mine with this actually and removed all of those leaves and it's pushing a lot of new growth and it looks really healthy but like i said that developed from really really poor air circulation and there was way too much humidity for that plant um, so it happens but you can always come back from it tyler do we have any questions 
no questions but this would be the time to ask yeah i didn't realize how long we had gone um so i was trying to quickly wrap up you know the watering the lighting is the easiest thing it moves to pests that's kind of middle ground and then diseases is when you have a serious problem on your hands um, and you always want to quarantine pest disease plants just to make sure it doesn't spread um, while we're waiting for questions and just wrapping up at the end i brought this really sad little calico hearts um that got put in the wrong spot at the nursery and was getting hit by irrigation. So watering practices are important. Um, you don't want to water the leaves of your plants. That's also going to lead to this problem. Um, so this calico hearts has developed a fungus. Its leaves have been falling off and you can see that black spot right there. So that was caused from this plant staying too moist, but also getting hit with our irrigation here, which was hitting the leaves of the plants and causing um, you know stuff to grow so pretty sad but it happens and i always tell people the best way to learn about house plants is to just try it and you're gonna fail i mean maybe not you might be perfect but i've definitely killed some house plants uh we had the question about the calathea i had one last winter that i was just so tired of watching die that i just threw it outside then I got a little bit sad, but it happens. Yeah. No questions. Just no more questions. Nope. Well, thank you guys for joining me for this webinar. I hope you learned a few things. If you have other questions, you can always email us, um, get a hold of us on our Instagram account. We are good at answering that right away. Um, but as far as like basic house plant problems, always start with watering or placement of the plant. Know that plants go through changes with the seasons. Um, it also takes them a little while to acclimate to a new space. So if you just bought something and it's not looking happy, chances are it's not that happy, but it will be if you just give it some time um, to get there. Always check in on your plants. Always give them a good look over. I know we had the question about bringing your plants in for the winter. Um, it's always a good measure just to have some neem oil to like kind of clean your leaves before you bring them in. Check it out. Make sure you're not bringing some uh, pesty, you know, creature into your home that is going to spread. Uh, but yeah, look at our peace lily. She is full show now. So our webinar went an hour. This peace lily took an hour to bounce back. Um, there's a couple sad leaves that just kind of got bent. There we go. But yeah, I hope you guys learned some information about houseplants and have a lovely day. Thank you. Yeah.